Welcome. We want to welcome you to St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We are once again worshiping at Yale Avenue Presbyterian Church, and we're grateful to their pastor and their elders to allow us to film here uh, since our church house uh, caught fire a few months ago. So once again, welcome. Welcome, St. Andrews. <laughs> Please join with me call to worship this morning. We come this morning to praise God, three in one. Heaven and earth are full of God's glory. We come embracing our adoption as God's sons and daughters. We come with praise and thanksgiving, worshiping the God we love.
Please join with me in time of confession and silent prayer. Let us pray to the one who gave us new life. O oh God, sometimes we are so filled with awe that we think we are unworthy of you. Forgive us when we doubt our identity. Forgive us when we shrink from your call. Forgive us for not understanding how you created us. Call us, love us, save us, inspire us, sustain us. Lift us up in Jesus' name. Assurance of God's pardon this week. God so loved the world and every one of us that God sent Jesus to show their love. In Christ we are forgiven, loved, and treasured beyond measure. Thanks be to God. Our reading today is from the book of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, You must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. 
If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Scripture reading today is taken from the Old Testament, from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty. The hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now the pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I I am a man of unclean lips, and I, I live among a people of unclean lips. And yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Here ends our reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What time is it? Well, you know, that kind of depends. A a while back, I had to call a church in El Paso, and and I was surprised that they were closed for lunch. And then I remembered, even though El Paso is in Texas, central time, it is actually in mountain time. It goes with New Mexico and Colorado, not Texas. It's only been maybe 150 years that the railroads got together and tried to standardize time so they could keep track of the trains running across the country. Before that, the long history of different countries, time could vary. And so often people would describe something on the basis of a significant event. Um, we might say the, the year of the 9-11 or the year of the bombing in Oklahoma City. Uh, and, and in the Bible, often there is a comment about something that happened in the year of a king. In this passage from Isaiah, It begins in the year that King Uzziah died. And that could be simply a way of noting the time. But it also says something to us about what was going on in Isaiah's life and in the people that lived in Jerusalem in the year that King Uzziah died. 
Anytime there is a succession, there can be uncertainty, there could be even civil unrest because it, it was never clear who would become king next. Sometimes it was the oldest son of the king that died, but sometimes it was not. Uh, king Solomon, for example, was not the oldest son of David. And when his son took the throne, uh, he was a young man and he had a lot of young advisors. He didn't, he didn't trust the old elderly statesmen. So there was a lot of turmoil. When King Uzziah died, there was the turmoil of, of the people of Israel, of Jerusalem, contending with these powers outside of themselves. Even in the heyday and, and, and the, the greatness of David and Solomon, Israel was a small country between two large world powers, Egypt on one side, Assyria, and then Babylon, and then Persia on the other. And they fought back and forth over these countries. There was constant fear and turmoil. And Isaiah, in the midst of that anxiety, went to church, went to worship. Just as, as we have experienced all the turmoil of this last year, we look to, to worship, we look to God's word, we look to fellowship of other Christians, even if it's only online, to be strengthened and supported and, and comforted. So Isaiah went to the temple to worship. And in the temple, he had a vision. He, he saw the Lord high and lofty, lifted up, and in effect, sitting on a throne in, in the front of the temple. And it said that the hem of his garment came down. And, and probably Isaiah was seeing the veil of the temple and, and imagining that somewhere up in the heavens, God was sitting, looking down on his throne. A, a, a vision of the power and majesty and might of God in the midst of the anxieties of, of the danger of foreign invaders taking over. Isaiah, Isaiah had a vision of the Lord God. And, and in that vision, there were seraph, seraphim that <clears throat> were thought of being kind of angelic beings. They had three sets of wings. They flew, they covered their face, they covered their feet, and, and as they flew and were celebrating the power of God, they sang, holy, 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 holy. Now, that was not the reaction of, of Isaiah. He didn't say, how great thou art. He did not sing, our God is an awesome God. No, no, Isaiah fell on his knees and, and said, woe, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I have seen the Lord confronted by the majesty, the holiness of God, Isaiah was contrite. Isaiah recognized his own sinfulness. For when he says, I'm a man of unclean lips, he's not simply talking about his lips, is he? I, I saw something funny the other day that President Biden when he goes to one of these state dinners, will not eat the salad because he doesn't want to be photographed with a piece of salad in his mouth. He, he, he wants to look good. Well, that's, that's not what Isaiah is concerned about. He is saying, I am a sinner. Before the holiness of God, I, I am a sinner. 
he confessed his sin before the Lord. You know, that, that is, in, in a sense, a basic understanding of our faith. The holiness of God and, and our own sinfulness. But in our culture today, it, it's, not pos, it, it's not popular to, to say that we're sinners. It's not popular to say that we have flaws and, and shortcomings, that, that there's something the matter with us, is there? Many, many years ago, my wife and I participated in, in a small group that included Bible study and prayer, but it also had some personality tests, and you would get a, a report every week about something from your test, some insight that they had gained. And it was given to each person. You could share it. You could keep it private. But I discovered how difficult it was for us, as close as we were, to be open and honest about our shortcomings. We, we wanted to keep those kind of close. We didn't want to share. We didn't want people to know that, that we had flaws. And, and yet, and yet, isn't that the first step on the road to, to new life? To recognize our sinfulness, to repent and turn in a new direction? I come back frequently to Alcoholics Anonymous because that first step is being willing to stand up in front of other people and say, I am an alcoholic. To make that confession is the step on the road to recovery. And it is for not only Isaiah, but for, for each one of us to say that we are a man, a woman of unclean lips. And, and we dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. You think about that. Not only did he recognize he was sinful, but he recognized the sinfulness of, of his whole people. Now, if it's unpopular for us to admit our own individual sin, it is much more difficult for us to admit our corporate sin. We, we live in a culture of radical individualism. I'm accounting for myself, but I am not responsible for anyone else. We don't have a sense of social responsibility, do we? or at least we try not to. Years ago, I was in a, a group discussing capital punishment, the death penalty. And, and many people in that group said they didn't like that. They didn't believe in it. it. It was not right to kill someone because they had killed someone. And, and that discussion went on until someone said, I, I really don't like that. but." But that's not my concern. I, I am concerned for the person who actually executes the prisoner. That person who kills another person is responsible. But, but she did not see that she had any responsibility. Even though she was a citizen, she was part of a state, she had a corporate responsibility, as do we all for what happens in our country. She could not, she could not see that. And, and there is so much pushback to the sense of social responsibility, of, of corporate responsibility, in addition to the sense of individual responsibility. You know, this is the, the time for Tulsa to commemorate the Tulsa race massacre of a hundred years ago, 1921. And, and for many, many years, 
That was not talked about in Tulsa, according to people that grew up here. They said, I never heard anything about that until maybe 30 years ago. And, and people began to talk about it. And, and now it is out in the open and people are recognizing we had a responsibility for something that went on a hundred years ago. There's even more than just the race riot. The year before the Tulsa race massacre, there was a lynching of a white man. A year before that, there was a, a time when a number of people for a, a particular, uh, basically a labor union called the International Workers of the World that were trying to organize oil field workers and they were they were arrested for nothing and then allowed uh, to be taken out of the jail by a group of people and taken out of town and, and beat up and tarred and feathered and run out of town because the oil field, oil companies did not want a union. And so violence is not simply racial. Sometimes violence is also economic. So, I think we need, like Isaiah, to be open and honest about our failings. How do we ever learn? How do we improve? How do, how do we see a better future than the past if we are not willing to be honest about what has happened? You know, that that is really not all that strange, is it? Many sports teams spend the day after a game, if you play uh, uh, college or professional football, maybe Monday will be taken breaking down the film, looking at what happened. Uh, if the quarterback threw an interception, why did that happen? How could he keep that from happening again? If, if somebody missed a tackle, what, what went wrong? You have to be painfully honest with yourself and each other. And it, it's common for ministers. When you are in training to preach, you are brought together with your classmates and your professors, and they take apart your sermon word by word, and you have to take that, but it is in order to grow. Now, I have to tell you something. I actually watch myself on Sunday mornings, and, and I began noticing some time back a strange, a strange gesture that I was making. I call it my bird clucking. I don't know if you've noticed, but sometimes I, I kind of start moving my hands and I'm going up and down like this. If I had any sense, I would practice and quit doing that because it's distracting. Now, maybe you hadn't noticed, but I bet you now that I've told you, you will, won't you? But we learn, we learn from our mistakes, we learn from our confession, we learn from, from looking at what we're doing, and I think that should apply to all of us. There is, there is a strong movement of people to say, let's forget the past, let's just move on. I even heard someone on the radio talking about the Tulsa race massacre. Wasn't, wasn't a local person, but they were talking about the teaching of history and, and how we should teach it in the public schools. And they used the example, we shouldn't focus so much on the massacre and, and as bad as that was, let, let's put that behind us. Let's focus instead on how the black community rebuilt after the massacre uh, and, and their commitment and dedication and so forth. He had a point, but if we only focus on the positive, 
we, we will never get better if we're not willing to face up to our problems, our failures, our shortcomings. Where are we? And, and how can we as Christians face up to that? It is because of what happened next. They said in his vision, not in reality, but in his vision, one of the seraphim went to the altar with, with the pair of tongs and grabbed a burning coal and burned the uncleanliness off of his lips. Now, again, that's not meant to be literal, but it is a way of saying we are forgiven and cleansed and renewed. Isn't, isn't that the good news? Not that we are perfect, not that we are even good, but that we are forgiven, loved, and renewed in Jesus Christ. And then God comes to Isaiah and to you and me and says, who will go for me? Who will serve? And Isaiah said, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Use me. It isn't that the good news that in our fallenness, in our sinfulness, in our failures, God nevertheless can use us and, and calls us to be his hands and feet and voices and lives in this world, to be agents of love and grace and renewal in a world that certainly needs to hear of God's love. If we block out our failures, if we close our eyes to our corporate responsibilities, we will never grow in grace. But if we allow God to use us, we too can say, here I am, take me, use me in your service, O Lord. Let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we are so tempted to put on a good front, even with you, even though we know you know our inward being. We are so tempted to, to put on a good front with other people and, and not admit our failures, our shortcomings that, that we know you can use for your service. Lord, you used all sorts of people from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and Isaiah. You have used all sorts of people in your service. Use us, use us this day we pray. In Christ's name. Amen.
We are once again glad that you have been with us during this service of worship. Uh, we hope you'll come join us again next Sunday or whenever you uh, watch and take part in the service. We feel like we are one, only one part of the Church of Jesus Christ all around the world and we are united in Christ as we come together and as we go out. So as you leave this service, we do pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the communion, fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you, with each one of us this day, every day. Amen.